Today on Larry King Now, skateboarding icon, Tony Hawk. A lot of people want to get into skating nowadays, especially for fame or fortune. The ones who thrive are the ones who continue to challenge themselves no matter how they rate among everyone else. The fact that it was on ESPN X Games, that created a fan base of people that didn't necessarily want to do it. And that's when we broke through a popularity barrier that we had been missing all along. But the only people who appreciated skating before that were the ones that were actually skating. Plus, when cities are debating getting a skate park in their area, there's always the stigma that, that attracts the bad crowd. Was it ever a true stigma? More in the 70s, you know, when people were literally breaking into backyards to skate empty swimming pools. Did you ever do that? I did, yeah. You did? Yeah, yeah. That's today on Larry King Now. Professional skateboarder turned entrepreneur, actor, and radio show host, Tony Hawk, credited for bringing skateboarding to the forefront of extreme sports. His Tony Hawk series video gaming franchise is one of the most successful ever. He also owns Birdhouse Skateboards, Hawk Clothing and Shoes, hosts a weekly radio show on Sirius Satellites called Faction Channel. Do you think you're a little nuts? <laughs> I mean, uh, what you do and that kind of, you know, boarding up in the air. You think I think it's... that maybe my parents thought that a bit, yeah, because I grew up really scrawny and, and almost like a runt, and I wanted to try these stunts. I was really determined, and I, and I love the, I love not, not the risk factor, but more the daredevil aspect of it. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to do it in a calculated way. I didn't want to just go through a caution in the wind. So um, they recognized that, and they supported it. I have a son like that. Should I worry about him? Yes, because my youngest son <laughs> is the craziest. He has no sense of mortality. <laughs> when was the first time you picked up a skateboard? Were skateboards popular when you picked it up? Yeah, it was uh, in the height of the 70s craze. You know, I was about nine years old. My brother, my older brother, was a surfer, and he skated a bit. So I picked up his old board and started doing it with friends in my neighborhood and eventually found my way to the skate park. You turned pro early, right? I was 14, yeah. How, where did you compete at 14? Um, there, was a, there was an amateur series of events uh, that were usually uh, centered around the skate parks in Southern California. So there was like a series around those parks. And then eventually I rose to the top of that circuit and the next step was to turn pro. But that was at a time when skating wasn't popular at all. So no one really It wasn't took smooth sailing at first though, right? Well, I was 14, so I didn't know any better. <laughs> You know. That's popularity, it goes up and down, doesn't it? Where is sk yeah. skateboarding in the popularity run? Um, I think it's bigger than ever. I, you know, when, I, when I turned pro and then through my high school years, it started to hit another, another spike um, in the late 80s. And then it really died like in the early 90s, basically. And then it came back in full swing, late 90s. And, and to this day, I think it's bigger than ever, especially in the, um, internationally. How did you get into the media aspect of it? Um, I think I was more thrust into it because as the X Games started, I was already an established name from my success in the 80s, and I had still been skating through and through. So there was a generation that recognized who I was, and then when the X Games came, that became, they, they were focusing on me because I was already known and I was still competing and doing well. And then eventually when my video game came out, that was when, that was when really my popularity changed completely. How did that idea come about a video game? Uh, there were a few um, publishers that were that were thinking about doing it, and I had a few meetings at the time. And when I finally hooked up with Activision, I realized that they had the right idea and the right direction. And with my expertise and my influence, we could make something really fun to play. And it worked. It, it worked far beyond my wildest dreams. Yes. <laughs> what makes a good skateboarder? Uh, determination. Um, perseverance and the, the constant desire to challenge oneself. Um, because a lot of people want to get into skating nowadays, especially for fame or fortune, and if they get any taste of that, they lose their motivation. Um, the, ones who are, the ones who thrive are the ones who continue to challenge themselves no matter how they rate among everyone else. Do you always enjoy it? I love it, yes. What is its thrill? That there's always something new to learn. Um, no matter how good you get at skating, you can still improve your skills. Wouldn't that be true of any professional sport? 
Yeah, I think so, but I like the individual pursuit of it and the artistic aspects, that you can do it in your own style, in your own flavor, and you don't have to listen to a coach, you don't have to rely on the team. Um, and, I mean, you can really be a successful skateboarder without having to compete ever, as long as you, as long as you perform, as long as you um, provide the footage and get the coverage. What made you Tony Famous? Was it the X Games? What made you? Um, I think on a mainstream level it was video games, for sure. Um, because our video game drew attention to skateboarding in areas and in, in audiences that never would have recognized it otherwise. You play yourself in the game, right? <laughs> I do, yeah. And how does the game work? Um, well, in, in, our, in our main series, you play as the skater and you, you complete different challenges. You try to link tricks together. You do combos. You, you try to gain as many points as you can um, on a level or in a time frame. You try to collect certain items. Uh, you try to move through the entire, um, the entire level uh, by opening up new spaces and new areas. And um, I mean, that's, that's through and through been... Did you lay it all out? No, but I had a big influence in it. I played it every step of the way. Are you, you, are you a technocrat? Uh, without being a programmer, perhaps, yeah. Um, I've always been into technology and always wanted to buy the newest stuff. Devising a video game is difficult? You know, the, the most difficult part was in the beginning was, was giving a crash course to the, to the developer on what skateboarding is and how to present it, how to present it fairly and, and appropriately. Um, because there's so many ideas that people have about what skating is or what extreme sports are, and a lot of it is exploitive and, and a lot of it is not true to what we are actually doing. Who's the player, a young boy? I, I don't know. I mean, especially now, a lot of people grew up with video games and a lot of people grew up with our franchise and they're in their 20s and 30s now still playing actively so I can't I, I, I can't categorize who really plays the game. Um, now I hear you've announced a new Tony Hawk Pro Skater video game. Uh, we're working on a game for mobile devices um, for phones and tablets. Uh, when we, is it coming? Uh, it'll be coming this year. I already got in trouble for saying that it's coming at all. So <laughs> now I have to backtrack, but it's basically for mobile devices and we have a swipe control system so that you utilize the actual touch screens. How far away is it? How far away is it? When will we have it? Oh, um, this year. Yeah. I'd say earlier than later. You can skateboard on your phone. You can control a, a character on your phone that skates, yes. This gives my wife another hour of staying awake every night. You can skateboard on the phone. Yeah, sure. I'll get her a copy, advanced copy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is your real name Hawk? Yeah. Because what a perfect name <laughs> to be a sports celebrity. Tony Hawk. Sounds devised. Yeah, there's some terrible rhyming that goes along with it. And when you're in um, junior high school, it doesn't seem like such a blessing. <laughs> Coming up 30 years after his professional debut and Tony's skateboarding swagger is still intact, he'll tell us how he does it after this. We're back with the great Tony Hawk. You just won a competition in Australia? Yeah, I did, last weekend in Sydney. How old are you? 45. Now, the, give me, the competition in skateboarding is what? What do you do in the, what did uh, you do in well, Australia? Well, this, this one was actually a bowl competition, so there is an, there's this empty swimming pool that's designed for skateboarding. It's right on the beach in Bondi in Sydney, and it's basically summertime there, so it was a great venue. Um, and so you have uh, 35 seconds to do a routine in the bowl. And whatever you can come up with, the judges score you on style, on speed, on usage, um, and on difficulty. Are you surprised that you still keep winning at 45? Um, well, it's always fun, obviously. Uh, I trained for that event, to be honest. I, I, I trained in other pools and, and tried to get some of that, those techniques down, and, and that's not something that I've done in a long time because usually I just skate straight vertical ramps, which are designed for skating and, and are, are always the same. And so the idea that you skate a pool that is, is really diverse and has a lot of different sort of curves and challenges, you've got to, well, you should prepare for that, and I did prepare for it. Could you skateboard in an empty pool in Beverly Hills? I have, yeah. You have? Yeah. Just for going through the pool and things? Yeah, yeah. Usually the ones that are designed for swimming are not as smooth, though. So they're not are as You're always finding new stunts, for what of a better word? Uh, yeah, I'm always trying to do new tricks, yeah. Uh, the tricks that I try now are more technical in terms of 
uh, board maneuvering and, and things like that instead of the big high spinning maneuvers, the big ramps and stuff. I've already broken my pelvis doing that kind of thing, and um, I, uh, I'd rather just stick with the t more technical shoes. How many times have you been injured? <laughs> I don't know. What have you broken? Uh, my pelvis, my thumb, my elbow, and my rib. And you come back all the time, you keep coming back. I do keep coming back, yeah. What about your son? Um, he's 21, he just turned pro as a skateboarder, and uh, he's making his own way. He, he has his own set of sponsors, and he's featured in other videos, and uh, I'm really proud of him. Just skateboarding, forgetting games or other things and all the things you're involved in. Can you make money just skateboarding? You can make money just skateboarding from sponsors, yeah. So if you have um, a skateboard sponsor, a clothing sponsor, shoe sponsors are usually the, the, the ones that pay the, the best because they're, they're the biggest. They, they, they transcend just skateboarding. Why do shoes want to get, why do shoe manufacturers want to get involved in skateboarding? Um, well, there's a specific type of shoe that's better for skating. And a lot of those shoe companies, like DC and Etnies, have, were founded within the skateboard world, and, and then they grew outside of that world and now are well-respected shoe brands um, across the board. I'm told you were the first ever skateboarder to land a 900. That's true. What is a 900? Uh, that refers to the gr degrees of spin. So it's basically two and a half spins in midair. Um, and I did that at the 1999 X Games for the first time. You practice it a lot? Uh, they're hard. <laughs> they're still hard for me. So I do them sometimes if the timing's right, if I feel good, if the crowd is really um, energetic, then I'll try to do it. But they don't come easily and I don't practice doing them quite a bit because if they go wrong, they go horribly wrong. Is there a lot of showmanship in this? Uh, yes and no. I mean, it depends on the skater. But in competition, they're not looking for that. Uh, it's more when you do tours and exhibitions that you can put on more of a show. How long can you keep on skateboarding? I don't know. I'm, uh, I guess I'm the litmus test for how long you can do it as a pro. <laughs> now, you've been in a variety of television shows, CSI Miami, several films, the Jackass franchise. You like acting? Uh, well, Jackass isn't really acting, is it? <laughs> no, I guess not. Yeah, um, no, but I enjoy it, yeah. Uh, you know, and if I'm, if I'm called to do that sort of thing, uh, I just did the show Rake, and, um, but I usually play myself, and so that's relatively easy. What's your radio show? Uh, we do a show on Sirius XM every Tuesday, and basically I talk about my travels, we play new music, we interview people either from our world or even outside of our world if I can have access to them. In fact, you know, if you want to come on anytime, just call in and we'll have a chat. How, do, how does it work? Uh, it's a podcast? No, it's a... No, it's Sirius XM. It's yeah. a radio. Yeah, every Tuesday, 4 p.m. Pacific. I'll call in. We'll arrange it with our people. I'll call in. That'd be awesome. Because maybe you get me involved in skateboarding. <laughs> sure. Do you ever think you're going to quit? Um... I can't picture myself quitting altogether. I can picture myself not doing it, say, in the public eye, and maybe not. You don't not. need to do it, do you? I mean, financially, you don't need to. I guess you don't need not, to but skate. I just, yeah, I, I can't, I can't quit. And also, I mean, to, to have all this success and to have, obviously, these, these companies and, and, and be so embedded in the industry, I, not that I have to, but I do feel like I want to walk the walk. You know, I don't want to just sit there talking about skating and not actually doing it. Do you control your own clothing line? Uh, yeah, for the most part. I mean, you pick the stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. Who manufactures it? Uh, Cherokee, no. And you keep abreast of that, right? You keep on Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it just, the, it just switched ownership from Quicksilver to Cherokee, so um, very much on top of that. And now we have the uh, opportunity to take it internationally. After the break, will skateboarding ever become an Olympic sport? We'll get Tony's thoughts. Don't click away. We're back with the great Tony Hawk. If, if curling, if curling can be an Olympic sport, <laughs> which is basically shuffleboard, right? I, we came up with a great sport the other day. Skateboarding, no, surfboard, a surf, uh, shuffleboard on ice for older men. It's called broken hip. We can get it. <laughs> nice. Well, you ever see skateboarding in the Olympics? I think we will. I mean, if you look at the success of snowboarding in the Winter Games and how that's brought a more youthful edge to the Olympics in general, they don't have that with the Summer Games. They don't have anything that's drawing in a, a younger viewership. And so I think they, to be honest, I think they need skateboarding more than we need them because 
skateboarding's popularity is solidified for the most part in a lot of countries. How do you propose it though? How do you go about it? You go to the International Olympic Committee? How does it work? Um, there have been talks and I've been involved in a couple talks, but, but I have heard, I don't know if it's too definite or not, but I have heard it's very likely going to be in the 2020 games. That would be a great boon, right? That'd be great, yeah. Now you would be a commentator. Yeah, I don't world. think I'd compete. You would not compete. Is there a major young skateboarding star now? Uh, there are there are plenty of them, yeah. I mean, uh, I think there are a few, like the guys who would be skating the ramp. The guys who would probably be in the Olympics, I uh, say on the U.S., is a guy like uh, Michi Brusco or Tom Schar. Both of them have, have broken the 1080 barrier. They've done three spins in the air um, in the last few years. Uh, one of the guys I just saw in Australia, Alex Sorgente, uh, he has come into his own in a huge way, and he's going to be a star, too. Uh, you've never done three spins, have you? No, I mean, the, my uh, 900 stood until f three years ago. Really, that yeah. long? Yeah, um, and I, I killed myself. I mean, I really got, <laughs> I went through many trials and tribulations trying to get 900s and, and injuries, and um, I would not want to put myself through that for a 1080. Before the X Games, what was skateboarding? Um, I mean, it was ESPN it was a sport. I mean, a sport though, yeah, I mean. no, because there I grew up competing. I grew up competing when I was ten years old. So competitions for skateboarding have been there through and through. It's just that they weren't on a bigger broadcast network. So and and you know ESPN took the same exact formula. In fact, the same exact organizers to produce the X Games. So. It's not that they created competition in the format, it's just that I think that the fact that it was on ESPN The X Games, that created a fan base of people that didn't necessarily want to do it. And that's when we broke through a popularity barrier that we had been missing all along. The only people that skated before that, the only people who appreciated skating before that were the ones that were actually skating. And then once The X Games came, there's people sitting on the couch that understand what a 360 flip is. You know, that didn't happen when I was a kid. How do you prepare for a competition? Uh, well, if, if it's uh, on a ramp, you either try to skate the ramp it's going to be on or you, you prepare routines knowing that you're going to be ready for that exact course um, and hopefully learn something new that you can pull out of your bag at the last second without anyone knowing. It's hard to, it's hard to do new things and not be known for it. So if you can learn something new and keep it under wraps and then do it at a contest, that's worth a lot. Have you seen, do you see things now that amaze you? Every time, yes. Um, the, the, the height, the, the consistency of technical tricks and the difficulty levels now is stuff that we never dreamed of. We never dreamed of 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago. Are women in the sport? Yeah, um, more than ever, actually. The ratios are much larger now. Um, and, and especially internationally, the ratios are, are, are better than, than here. Like what to what? Um, like there is a there is a, a a very successful skate program in Afghanistan called Skatistan, and the ratio is 50-50. Wow! And they say it's the only co-ed sport in Afghanistan, so I think that's pretty fascinating. Does the sport still get the respect you think it deserves? I think it gets more respect than it has in the past. Um, I think it still has a long way to go in terms of general mainstream acceptance, especially in within city councils. Um, when cities are debating getting a skate park in their area, there's always the stigma that, that attracts the bad crowd, that it's not a healthy choice for the kids, and they're just not looking past their own stereotypes. Did it ever have that? Was it ever a true stigma? Um, I think more in the 70s, you know, when people were literally breaking into backyards to skate empty swimming pools. That, that didn't <laughs> bode too well for the <laughs> reputation of it. <laughs> did you ever do that? I did, yeah. You did? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Where? well, all the skate parks were closing in the, in the early 80s, and I still wanted to do it, so we would just go wherever we could, find Where, any swimming Where'd pools. you grow up? San Diego. In 2002, you started the Tony Hawk Foundation. What does it do? We help to support public skate parks in low-income areas. So cities and communities that are trying to get parks in their area, we help to give them resources and funding and, and basically the book on how to get it pushed through the, the red tape. Um, to date, we've, uh, we've helped to fund over 500 parks. We've given away over $4 million and, um, and we're starting an international outreach program with a group like Skatistan. So um, 
we're trying to branch out and, and, and help people in all communities. Is there, is it an expensive proposition for a city to build a skate park? Not compared to other facilities, no. Um, a general skate park is, is I'd say, about $100,000. They range from even like $25,000 to a million dollars. But, you know, for a decent facility, it's about 100 to 200. Um, if you see a skate park get built in a city, especially a new one, it gets used from sunup to sundown. Um, and while other sports facilities stay empty. And, and that's when the cities recognize the, the, the need and, and the usage of it. Is it more popular in better climate states? Um, I mean, you have a skate park. Not really. In, I no, mean, really? Minneapolis has skate parks? Yeah, yeah, for sure. We, we have skate parks in, in all 50 states. Um, but the, um, the skate industry was based in California mostly because it was sort of spawned from surfing. And now it's not like that at all. And so there are skate parks all over the place, a lot of indoor places for, play, for, for the cities with adverse weather. There's indoor skateboarding too? Yeah. Of course, in a cold weather climate, wouldn't you freeze? Exactly, yeah. Have you skateboarded in cold weather? Y yes. <laughs> it's Is very it cold. Yeah. I've, I've actually dug snow off of skate parks and ramps to get out there. Next, well, Tony will answer your questions. We'll play a little game of If You Only Knew. We'll be right back with Tony Hawk. Stay with us. We're back with Tony Hawk, some social media questions. Bryson Knox on Facebook. Do you still feel like you can take on younger competitors in skateboarding competitions? <laughs> uh, maybe some of them, but uh, <coughs> I, I think, I think there's, a, uh, there's an era of kids coming up that are really well-rounded, that are able to skate um, almost any terrain. And I've always been focused more on the vertical, which is the pool and the ramps. And so um, when it comes to a more general sense, they could destroy me for sure. <laughs> uh, Mark Webster on Facebook, as you get older, what do you do to speed up your recovery from injuries? Uh, my best answer is I get out there as quickly as possible. If I let my injury sort of, if, if, I, if I let it affect me and I let it drag me down and I, and I stay off my board for too long, it's much harder to get back to it. John Grist on Facebook, who are your favorite skateboarders? Um, well, one of my first heroes uh, was Eddie Alguera, who was very progressive for his time. Um, Steve Caballero, who's still, they're both still skating today, actually. And um, I really enjoy uh, Bob Bernquist. Uh, Ken Catherine on Twitter, what's your best memory of your skateboarding career? Um, my best memory, besides making the first 900, was probably being on The Simpsons. Being on The Simpsons. Yeah. They drew you. They did, yeah. I mean, that's... What was the story? Uh, the, story was that, the story was that Bart was emancipated from his parents, and he moves into this apartment building, and I live on the top floor. <laughs> and so it's his dream come true, and he ends up becoming my roadie on tour. <laughs> Here's a good question. As Sam Flaps via Twitter, how important is the skateboard? Um, well, without it, we wouldn't be able to do this, no, obviously. I know. Um, but we've always argued the horse to the jockey. How yeah, important is uh, the board I, to the skater? If, let's, I'll ask it this way. The greatest skateboard ever made with a pretty good skateboarder. An average skateboard with a great skateboarder. Who would you bet on? Oh, the, the pretty good skateboard, yeah. Um, you can, I mean, you can make a skateboard maneuver however you want it to. There's different shapes that are more conducive to your style of skating. And like the board I ride is, is much wider than anything we, we actually produce because I have size 13 shoes and I don't want kids to be riding a board that wide when their, their feet are tiny. So it's basically a scaled down version of what I ride. Um, and the shapes are all pretty standardized now. So, um, it's, it's important, but it's not, it's not that crucial. What tricks, uh, Quinn Smith, Instagram, what tricks have become more difficult to land? <laughs> um, spinning tricks, as I get older. The, the stuff where you have to really ball up and get and spin um, is, uh, is more challenging because I don't spin quite as fast, so I have to actually get higher to complete the same amount of spin. Rodney McCarthy on Twitter wants to know, how has YouTube and Vine changed skateboarding? Um, it's given access to people all across the world to uh, immediately to what's happening in, in the world of skateboarding. And so tricks, it used to be that tricks, you know, the, generally the skate industry was in California. If someone learned something new, 
you wouldn't see it for months later because it was that was in, when it was in the magazine. And by then, they moved on to other things. And so people on the East Coast say we're getting this sort of delayed uh, update. Now it's immediate. As soon as something new happens, something monumental, it's out there on the internet. We now play a little game. If you only knew, I just throw it out. Okay. Okay. First girl you ever kissed. <laughs> uh, Monica. Monica. Yeah. How old were you? Uh, I was. 13, I think, or 14? A little late. A little late. She was at the skate park, so I, oh. I impressed her. Well, today, now, it's uh, six. <laughs> <laughs> funniest fan encounter. Uh, funniest fan encounter. Um, a guy tried to, a guy recognized me at a urinal and then reached his hand out to shake my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was funny, but it was awkward. Weird. Yeah. City with the best skate parks. Wow, city with the best skate parks. That's tough. Um, San Diego's got some really good skate parks now. City with the most underrated skating culture. City I might not think of that really is hip with skateboarding. Um, oh, I could get in so much trouble right now with so many people. I think that uh, Minneapolis has a really strong skate scene and people don't, you know, they don't realize I mean, that's it. That's why I asked before they yeah. even skipped it. You're left on a desert island. What three things do you want with you? Um, does my family count as one? Yeah. Uh, my family, my music, and my skateboard, assuming that it's not all sand. If not skateboarding, what would you want to do? If there were no skateboarding, what would Tony Hawk <laughs> be? there's no be? skateboarding. Um, that's a good question. I, I always enjoyed uh, doing video editing on computers. In fact, I had one of the first nonlinear systems. So, really? Um, yeah, I, I, th that was So you're into enjoyable. technical stuff? Yeah. What keeps you up at night? What do you worry about? Um, the safety of future of my children. Biggest misconception about Southern California? Um, that it's a bunch of stoners and hippies. <laughs> Something we don't know about you. Uh, I quit playing violin to uh, become a skateboarder. This when you were a little kid? They gave when you I was a kid, yeah. I, uh, well, I was, I was starting to progress in, in playing violin and in my music class. And then I started getting good at skating and I started competing on the weekends. And my music teacher said, you know, I want you to do these concerts. You and were that good? I mean, good enough to be doing that kind of thing. It was school concerts, but, um, and I thought I had to make a I had to make a definite choice at that moment, and I, I chose skateboarding. I mean, I'm glad I did, but I don't know why I had to make it so black and white, because it'd be fun to still play. Could have been the fiddling skateboarder. <laughs> Up on a skateboard. That's probably not the best title to use in skateboarding. <laughs> thanks, Tony. All right, thanks, Mike. Big thanks to my guest, the legendary skateboarding pioneer, Tony Hawk. As always, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things, hopefully with a better voice next time.